Exodus chapter 18 gives us a story of how God, uh, through his faithful covenant promise to to be the God of Israel, he has to set them free from the hand of Pharaoh. He does that by raising up Moses. Moses leads the people out of Egypt towards the promised land, and they spend some time in the wilderness. And during that time, they're, 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 a, big, they're a big population. And the system that was set up was that Moses was the judge of the people. That any time any people, anyone had a dispute or a question or needed just someone to help them work things out, they would take it to Moses. So much so that Moses is having his whole life devoted to just solving the problems of the people. And his father-in-law, Jethro, comes to him and says, why do you do this? Why are you the judge over every conflict of this nation? And this is what Moses says. He says, I do this because the people come to me to inquire of God. And that's the old system, right? There's this thing that we need help with, and this person's really in touch with God, so let me talk to him. He can talk to God, and then we'll work it out. In Exodus 18, Jethro had to set up a, another system to delegate the, the people's problems through a system of, of judges. But that's the idea, and it's still the idea so often in our pursuit of God. That if there was a religion that could just point me towards a priest or a shaman, or it's the, the Greek expressions of the poets, that they are inspired by God and they bring that inspiration to the people. When I just I went to India not long ago to see all the work that we're doing to support what God is doing in India, and there were men on the street dressed in white, and they would stand on the corners and offer blessings to people because they were holy men. Would you like me to bless you as you walk by? And many people would come and drop money into their, into their, their collection hat and, and say, please bless me or offer me wisdom. And they'd leave thinking, oh, I wonder what blessing I'm going to receive. An Eastern mystic has blessed my life. He's offered me wisdom. Because there's a thought in the, in the, in the mind and the hearts of people to think, oh, if, if I could just meet that person, he could help me. And it's not an Eastern mystic idea. It's something we all kind of think about. And all the expressions of our own pursuits of God can sometimes fall into this idea that this, what we're doing right now in gathering together, someone opens the word or a, a band sings a song, and so many times... For so many people, this is the closest they will come to a relationship with God. If I can just make it to next Sunday and hear something from the pastor or hear some song that will lift my soul to get me through the next week, and th that's why I go to church. In my own life, as I'm someone who works at a church, I'll go sometimes to uh, a dinner with friends, non-believers, or family members that aren't, aren't really believers in God and the you know the common thing when it's time to pray for the dinner everyone's like oh pray for the dinner um pastor why don't you pray <laughs> I think oh, I, I can pray just like you all can pray we can all bless food we can all ask God to bless the unity of fellowship of getting together and breaking bread we can all pray for the needs of our finances or our families or what's going on in our life we can all the promise is for all. It's not just for one person. And this should radically change the way that we pursue God. That it doesn't require these four walls, this expression of our worship as a limitation to what God can do in our lives. But rather, all of us can come and be unified in God's Spirit, hear something that is inspired by the Spirit for our church and for some of us individually to go and act on and to be hearers and doers of the Word, but all of us running to the quiet places of our life, in our own homes, the quiet place of your living room early in the morning, or that one walk that you can find next to the river in the foothills or in all the ways that God is calling you to know him just between him and you because the promise of the Holy Spirit, the new way that God is reconciling himself to the world is for everyone. And here's the test of this. 
so often you come to church or you hear a sermon like this and it's just a reality of life that we're all going to go into the trenches of the the day-to-day routine of our lives we have jobs awaiting us we have conflict awaiting us we have interpersonal relationship drama awaiting us it's going to be different for all of us but james chapter one is true count it all a joy the various trials of life they're just there And the old way of thinking is to have a long day or to have a burden of your heart or to have something just plaguing your mind that you can't really shake or just the questions that you have and the need for wisdom. The old way of thinking is I just wish I had a friend I could call. I I know exactly who I'm going to go to. I need to call my mom or my dad or my best friend. I need to have my coworker just help me work out this situation. There's things that I just can't crack the code of, and I just wish I, I had somebody I could ask some advice to. I have a, such a, a burden on my heart, I need a shoulder to cry on. Now, all the expressions of your friendships and your relationships that exist in, in a way that can help you with those things are good. But what this tells us is the first thing the thing that is going to offer you the most comfort, the most wisdom, the most lifting of burdens from your heart is the power of God through the Holy Spirit. So the new way to handle your life because of this promise is that when the the days get long and the challenges of life come, you have an advocate in God for all that you need. Anyone who lacks wisdom, let him go to God and it will be given him liberally. When you have something, a burden on your heart, Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest for your soul. All of this is made available to you through the power of the Holy Spirit. And in all the way our friends and our family members and our coworkers can help us a little bit, God wants to to lift us and, and, and take care of the burdens of our heart and give us wisdom that is from heaven in a way that only he can do. But it requires us to act in the fullness of God's faithfulness towards our life that we believe he really is the best source of comfort, the best source of intimacy, the best source of wisdom, the best source of all the other things that we look for in the relationships of our life. We now have the power of the Holy Spirit to make that available to us. The application, go from this place. Go draw near to God this week. Spend time with him in prayer. Know him intimately in a way that has nothing to do with the words of a preacher, that has nothing to do with the the calendar of a church, but it's because you have a God that you love intimately and you experience his love with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your life. I long to be part of a church that bleeds out of the four walls of a church and walks in the spirit in the neighborhoods and the cities and the workplaces that are all represented in this place. It can't happen if the preacher is the only one who has access to God. It can't happen if the access to God is maintained in the sanctuary. But we can be expressions of God's love and mercy and grace to our city if we ourselves accept the fulfilled promise that the Spirit is for all. All of us have access. I'm nobody special. This, This building is just a building. God wants to be known. He wants to bring you back to that original relationship, the the intention of his heart for this creation through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the reason behind it. The reason for the Holy Spirit, there's a very clear answer given by Jesus in verse 8 of chapter 1, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be now witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. There's a very clear model given here. You're going to receive power from the Spirit. That power is going to put, put me display in your life, and you will reach people wherever you go, and it'll come out just like the covenant promises of God have always done. Kind of go outward. But... That is not always the lens of which we read the scripture with, with the simplicity of God's Holy Spirit and promises being fulfilled in our lives very simply so that he can be glorified and he can use our life. Because what happens so often is that we read scripture or we hear about the promises of God and we apply them very immediately in a a direct way to our own personal hopes and dreams and desires and the, the way that we wish our life would be playing out, and we look at the promises of God as a way to unlock some other means to a different end. 
It's the culture we live in. There's, there's, there's never been, in the history, I think, of, of trackable data, there's never been a way to know so much about your interactions with your friends and your family members. We live in an age where you can put yourself onto the internet and you can literally track how many friends you have. You can track how many friends like the things that you're sharing. You can track how many comments you're getting in the conversation starters. And it goes beyond that. You can track things about just who you are. You can find out how many steps you've taken in a day, how many calories you've intaken, how many hours of sleep you've averaged for the last month. And the reason these categories of stats continue to grow, and they probably will never stop, is because we take deep interest into the statistics of ourselves. That's why they're there. And this is nothing new, by the way. This is the original draw away from God towards our own things is, and is the lens that turn inward in applying everything directly to ourselves. I want to share a passage of script, scripture with you in Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19 is a story that's commonly called the story of the rich young ruler. And very short synopsis of that story, there's a man that comes up to Jesus and says, what am I supposed to do to get this life that you're offering? And Jesus says, do these commandments and you'll do well. His response is, I've been doing them from my youth, and it's just not quite enough. Whether or not he's actually fulfilled every commandment since his youth is a different sermon. But Jesus' response is this, one thing you still lack, sell everything that you own, give it to the poor, and follow me to which the gospel accounts say that he had to walk away sorrowful for he had many riches. The, the side point of that is that it's, it's when you invest so much into this life that the identity of your life is in the possessions of this world, it becomes very hard to lose your life so that Jesus can save it. But Jesus says with men, it's impossible. For people who have dived into the trenches of this world, it is impossible to enter into the kingdom of God. But with God, all things are possible. No rich person is outside of God's grace. No poor person is outside of God's grace. There's no one outside of your comfort level, of your social environment, that is outside God's ability to save. But here's what the main point of this is. Then Peter, verse 27, answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Peter says, I see what you did there. The key to success in your kingdom is to leave all to follow. The guy wasn't able to do it, but we were. I did that, Peter says. And then he says, therefore, what shall we have for that? It said in another word, I did what you ask. Now, what are you going to give me? Isn't that the lens that he's that looking at the promises of God, pointed inward as to say, wow, Following Jesus could really be a beneficial idea for my life. It is a, a common thread throughout Scripture. As so many people look to the power and the, and the wisdom of God and apply it to the wrong things, it is a, a, one of the fatal flaws of a church experience. So many people come to church like, wow, I've done this. Now I'm waiting for the blessing. I'm waiting for you to just now do what I'm asking you to do with my life. But what's the promise for? Why are promises fulfilled in Scripture? Why is God so faithful to continually come back to His promise fulfilled in His time according to His faithfulness? Why does He always do this? Go back to Acts. Peter will be our case study because we now see a different kind of Peter. In the Gospels, we see a Peter that was the impressive disciple in his own ideas. He was the disciple that left all to follow, looking for a little scratch in return. He was the disciple that was never going to betray, betray Jesus, no matter what anyone else did. The disciple that Jesus couldn't wash his feet because far be it from Jesus to serve Peter in that way. And all of it kind of came back to Peter in all of those things. And yet now we see something else. We see Peter when the, the fullness of the promise is given to him. And he's actually baptized in the Spirit. And he's proclaiming the Word of God. And he's pointing people to Christ. This is some of the responses that he now gets. It says in Acts chapter 2, verse 11, in response to the, the Spirit falling upon the disciples, as they begin to speak languages that make sense to the hearers, but not necessarily the speakers, why is it all for? 
Is it to show that the disciples are these amazing righteous men? Is it to set the disciples up to be pastors and leaders that are going to do really well and make a name for themselves? This is what 11 says. It says, when we hear them speaking in our tongues, it's of the wonderful works of God. The Holy Spirit descends from heaven according to the faithfulness of God. Why? Because it empowers the disciples, these early believers, to do something that proclaims God to the circle of people that they were surrounded by. It is the glory of God that the promises are fulfilled. And there's something happening here that's very meaningful. Because often we think about the glory of God, we think about God's uh, commands for us to just love him and worship him. And so many people misinterpret that as a God who is just greedy for power or, or acclaim, greedy for someone to say he's doing a good job as God, but that's not what's going on. God pours out his spirit and he uses disciples to become witnesses of who he is, to show that Jesus was a fulfillment of God's plan all along, to bring people back to God, to show that the scriptures are now being fulfilled in real time. And when God is on display, when God is glorified, the result is people are drawn to who he is. The lost are found when the people who know God glorify him. The blind eyes are opened. The needy become satisfied in the presence of God. And in the, the sermon as it's played out, and these people wonder what they should do, it says the result of all of this is, is verse 41. Those who heard gladly received his word. They were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. In an instant, the church has begun. 3,000 souls go from not knowing the power of the promise of the Holy Spirit to not only hearing about it, but receiving it and being added to the number of what will become the church that spreads from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to Boise, Idaho, even now. And why does this spread happen? Why is it that the promise of God given to a group of disciples grows outwardly, space by space by space. It's because when you fully experience the relationship with God through the power of the Holy Spirit, it does something to expand the kingdom of God through your life. Through promises fulfilled in your life, people around you are drawn into what God is doing and you become a witness to what God is doing to take that promise from one family to one nation to one throne to the ends of the earth. It happens because God has put on display in your life in all of the ways that we look for God to move in our life, to answer our prayers, to apply the scripture to our lives in a way that starts opening doors and makes our life start making sense. There's something more meaningful happening than we realize. There's a couple examples that I always think about when I, when I think about the, the inward way we apply scripture or hope and dreams to our lives. There's, maybe it's because I work some with the college, college age, but there's, there's this question oftentimes in the life of a believer of who am, I, who am I supposed to be with? Who am I supposed to marry or start a life with, start a family with? And so often that question is, has this end idea of some person in mind. There's, there's a husband or a wife out there for me. And I'm just waiting on God to fulfill that desire of my heart. Now, that is a good prayer. It's a prayer that is attached to the faithfulness of God for the life of people that he really does want to bring together and give life more abundant and, and surround with a family. But a husband or a wife is not the chief end of that prayer. There's something more meaningful happening. When God starts moving and working into the inner details of your life and starts supplying you with fulfilled scripture and fulfilled promises in your life, it is not simply to add the details of your portfolio. There's something he's doing in all of that to bring glory to himself and to expand the promise beyond your life. Think about what marriage is. He takes two opposite people can't get more opposite than a man and a woman. And he brings them together in a miraculous way and makes them one flesh, despite all their different ideas about how life should work, about how a house should look, about what the temperature of that house should be, or that car. And all these little conflicts of man and woman along the details and the characteristics of them, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he brings them together in a way that is miraculous. And instead of bickering and fighting, they fall deeply in love with one another. 
And they're able to do something to put God's love on display for the little neighborhood that God places them in because marriage is challenging and it's hard. And there's a lot of marriages that struggle. Half of them don't work out. And so God has this promise for your life so that he can use your marriage to put him on display so that all those people around you in one small way can look into your life and say there's something different about that person. And you say, you're right. Our marriage has an intimate relationship with God and we understand his deep love for us and his standard of love is the love that we use for one another. And in doing that, God is glorified and the lost are drawn in and it's just one small tool that God uses to extend the promise. Why don't you try the Holy Spirit for your marriage? Is what you're saying to someone. And it's the same way all the other details of our life that we think about the question marks of God has this way to intervene into your life and to bring promises into fruition. And all of them are a way to put him on display. There are jobs represented in this sanctuary, probably hundreds, maybe a thousand of them. It wasn't just so that you could pay your bills. That's part of it. God provides and he takes care of you and he gives you a peaceful life. But he's also placed you somewhere very unique to your life. And he wants you to take the relationship of God beyond just a small gathering in church and take it into your own little workplace. Your career is not the end of your life. Your marriage is not the end of your life. Your bills being paid is not the end of your life. It is all a way for you to accept the promise. You believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to open a relationship with God that makes you understand him as a provider and a shepherd and a leader. And he takes you through this whole life from glory to glory and you put him on display. And the promise then goes from you to the people around you and from them to the people around them. And it continues to grow until it's, until it's where it is now in our city and beyond until God, the full promise of what he's doing is ready to come home and gather us all in into this kingdom that he's setting up. There is a purpose for God's promise keeping. It's so that he could be made known. That one, you would know him intimately in a relationship with him and your relationship would make him known to the world around you. Peter is, is posed with this question as he gives a sermon that puts this promise on display. It points out the covenant-keeping fulfillment of God portrayed in the cross of Jesus Christ, fulfilling the scriptures. He tells these people that the Spirit is for them, and they have a question. Here's what it is. This is what they say to him. Verse 37, When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, What? Should we do then? What's our, what do we do about all this? You've opened up our hearts. The hearts have been cut open. What is the response? And I want to tell you, if you're a believer in God and, you, and you're someone who is open to the promise of his Holy Spirit being something that allows your life to, to find its breath and walk with, there are people in your life that are so close to that question. So close to the question, what do I do? I've heard what you've said. I've looked at your life. It cuts me to the heart, and I just wonder, what am I supposed to do now? Don't think that God can't use your life. Don't think that God can't bring you into a situation where someone sees what the power of the Spirit means to your life, and it cuts them to their heart, and they look at you and say, what am I supposed to do? There's so many of those questions that could be awaiting this church this week. Here's Peter's response. Peter said to them, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sin, and you will receive the power of the Spirit. The power that Peter is moving in to understand Scripture and to make it known is available to anyone who does those things. Believe in Jesus in an act of repentance. All that means, very simply, is that you turn from all of the other ways that your life can find fulfillment because in the end, it will never satisfy you. Everything in your life, whether you believe in God and are pursuing him with all that you have, is offering some promise to you. Some promise to satisfy your needs, to pay your bills, to bring a little satisfaction, to bring a little pleasure. All of those promises are something that you look on to see this horizon line of your life and hope that it all works out. All Peter is saying, and all I'm saying to you now, is that there is no other promise that will be fulfilled in bringing you to your creator and igniting in you the purpose of your life to love him, allow his love to define your life and loving other people. No other promise of this world will fulfill that. 
And repentance means you look at the, the, you take a survey of your life and you look at all of your hopes and your dreams and the paths of your life and any one of them that isn't pointed towards God and the love of him receiving his love, like we sang about, is something you turn from. That's repentance. You turn from anything, any promise of this world that doesn't have to do with how God is reconciling himself to you through the power of Jesus Christ. And that is the gospel. That this is a free gift. The act of repentance does not require works. It doesn't require payment. It doesn't require church attendance. It is a turning around, looking and believing on the name of the Lord. And anyone who does that shall be saved, it says in, in the prophecy given by Peter. The cross sets us free from all of those other ways that the paths of our life have taken away from God. They've caused sin and shame and guilt and failure and let us down so many dead ends that we turn and look to the cross and we're set free in the moment that we accept it. And as soon as you call upon the name of Jesus as, you, as your Lord, as your Savior, your sin is dealt with. As soon as you repent and turn to God, the promise is now for you right here, right now. Hey, thank you so much for joining us today. I want to let you know that if you're interested in what we're up to as a church, you can follow us on all of the social media outlets. And we're going to put this sermon along with all of the other sermons on YouTube. So you can watch it again or share it with a friend if you'd like to. And if you're ever in the neighborhood, it would be so great to have you join us in person. We have a service on Saturday night and then two on Sunday mornings. I'd love to meet you. In the meantime, I hope you have a great week. God bless you, and I'll see you soon.